Uh, my name is Dean Darnick. I'm a dairy farmer from Baldwin, Wisconsin. Operate what's called a CAFO, a large animal uh, dairy. Uh, we milk about 1,550 cows, 1,700 cows total, 1,400 replacement heifers on our farm. And uh, we don't run a lot of land, so manure is a big problem. And uh, I'm here to find out what uh, what's possible for the future that we can uh, handle this manure in a more environmentally safe manner than it is currently doing. Okay. Well, I'm Mike Thierry. I used to own Thierry Engineering. We did uh, engineering work and agricultural waste, waste handling, waste storage. Uh, we do, did a lot of work on a lot of larger farms, and, well, farms of all sizes in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And I'm, all, I've done work with uh, anaerobic digesters over the years. I worked on the first two anaerobic digesters built in Wisconsin. I worked with anaerobic digesters in the state of New York. Uh, uh, one that's uh, on the was on the. Uh, State University of New York campus in Morrisville, and another one on a farm where folk at Cornell University are monitoring it. So I've been interested in digesters, worked with digesters, and worked with lots of different systems and manure handling. And, uh, so I'm interested in what's going to transpire here. Um, panel discussion, so both will be available to answer your questions. So with that, um, without any further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Dave Drewiski. Um, Dave holds a BS degree in scientific land management from the UW River Falls and MS degrees, that's plural, in urban and regional planning and real estate finance from UW-Madison. He had a 30-year career managing 3M's uh, global real estate portfolio. He now serves as the executive director of Kinney River Land Trust and is excited to make a contribution to the efforts of the landowners and members of the Kinney Kinnick River Land Trust. Um, it's a good fit for him because he's an avid fisherman and uh, trout fishing on the Lower Kinney has been a passion of his since 1974. Uh, his program is going to give an overview of what land use policy, best management practices, and technology can do to help preserve our prime farmlands and landscapes and maintain our extraordinary cold water streams. He will also discuss how a collaborative effort from public and private stakeholders will be necessary to assure these resources are available to future generations. And with that, Dave, I'm going to let you up. Thanks, Gary. Um, what you didn't mention is uh, once upon a time before the career career started, I was in the University of Oklahoma, in Central Wisconsin, uh, and and letting edge of the things going on there too. So it was a little bit like falling off a log. Um, but, um, and I suppose some of you are also maybe wondering why or how trout streams and more uh, waste management got on the same program. But hopefully by the time I'm done, you'll uh, uh, understand the connection. Uh, because everything is connected when you're trying to manage watersheds. Uh, one last thing. Well, no, two different ones. One's being recorded. Oh, okay. So, um, <clears throat> as, as you can see, this is actually the South Fork, but uh, it's, it's right below uh, Glen Park in River Falls. Uh, gorgeous little piece of real estate, as is much of the stream. Um, Knick Knick, people always wonder, you know, where it came from. It's actually a mispronunciation of a Ojibwa word. Uh, for a native tobacco that grew on the slopes. But one thing interesting about the Kinney and the St. Croix Valley is the two tribes, uh, the Ojibwa and Chippewa, considered the St. Croix River Valley, which includes the Kinney, so important that neither claimed it for themselves. Um, the fir uh, one of our board members actually is a great, 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 great granddaughter of the original settler of River Falls. 
he heard about it in Hudson, and he decided to settle there because, because it was the damnedest, prettiest falls you've ever seen. Um, he also noticed the great prairie soil, available timber, and water power that propelled the rapid growth of the community. Um, now, the land trust gets involved in various things besides land management. Uh, the photo on the left, uh, the river is very popular for kayaking, and that represents uh, the difference uh, of opinion between uh, kayakers and trout fishermen. Um, they don't tend to get along very well. And another issue, if you've seen the blue and white Free the Kinney signs, uh, that's not us. They're an affiliated organization, but they believe it's in the best long-term interest so for the health of the river uh, to remove the dams. And I'll have a little bit more on that. Uh, there's an also another issue. Uh, this is more amongst trout fishermen, but do you use worms or do you use flies? Uh, my position is whatever, whatever will catch them is good. We, we need more people participating in fishing and we want to preserve the resource for that. Um, so here's what we're trying to preserve. The photo on the left is down in the Kinney Canyon, that eight mile stretch between the city of River Falls and the St. Croix uh, State Park, or the Kinnikinick State Park, excuse me. And, and clearly, uh, it takes a great environment uh, to support trout. Uh, the native trout, the colorful guy on the top, is a brook trout. Uh, their population numbers are actually growing, especially in our uh, feeder streams and uh, along our springs. And the brown trout, which gets bigger and is more tolerant of uh, uh, warmer water, uh, is uh, very prevalent. Uh, you may hear the people down in the Driftless area, down La Crosse, Viroqua, talk about having the best trout fishing in the state. No, we do. Top, the highest numbers of trout uh, in the state are in the Kinney. Uh, so it, it's hard to argue that dams are causing a problem uh, when you have record trout numbers, but Trout are very sensitive. It's, it's much like uh, if you've ever climbed a mountain, the higher you get, uh, the less air there is to breathe. It's the same way with water. The warmer water gets, the less oxygen it is. And uh, that's the issue with trout. They need cold oxygenated water. Um, now, Trout Unlimited is one of our partners in managing the Kinney. And, um, for the last 25 years, they've managed the water going in and out of the city of River Falls. Um, and a tip of the hat to uh, the farm and land management community, uh, today, the water coming into the city is four to five degrees colder than the water exiting below Glen Park. Um, and the monitoring also shows that with the rise in temperature, uh, the water on both sides of town has increased by a degree to a, de a degree and a half. So uh, that is of concern. And in the lower Kinney, where we today have very good trout populations, those trout are, are seeing stress because water temperatures are getting higher uh, than they're comfortable at. If you've ever wondered why fish don't bite on a hot day, it's because they don't have enough, you know, when you're, it's oxygen. They're, they don't have enough oxygen to, uh, to digest food. Um, if anybody's a numbers person, um, here's some graphs that come from that Trout Unlimited study. On the left, Quarry Road is upstream from River Falls, and you can see the temperature coming in is uh, between 16 and 17 degrees. Uh, that's in the 60s for Fahrenheit people. Whereas below town, um, it's up in 18, 19 degrees, occasionally going over 20 degrees, which is putting it in the low 70s. And that red line there, uh, 22, 22 degrees uh, Celsius, is actually the lethal level. So there's not a lot of margin, which is one of the reasons that we're very much in favor of managing the watershed 
uh, as, as it is today. Now, what is a land trust? I'll go through this quickly. Um, I get the question a lot, but we're a private nonprofit, tend to be local, uh, and we look to manage, work with landowners to manage natural resources. Um, we use a number of tools to do it, and we have alliances with uh, 50 other land trusts in the state, and uh, over 1,700 in the country. Uh, the various tools we use to protect land include limited purchases. Um, we, at times, have partnered with the DNR, Fish and Wildlife Service, to acquire land and uh, help turn it into wildlife refuges and other uh, protected areas. Uh, sometimes landowners will donate or uh, give us a bargain sale on property. But the main, the main tool is uh, conservation easements, whereby a landowner would transfer either by donation or in fee, uh, essentially the development rights on the property, which will protect the land as, as you see it. And, and the last reason, or the last <laughs> uh, paragraph here is why I'm here. And really, uh, there's no way that a small organization can manage all the land, uh, but we need to network with like-minded conservation organizations and units of government uh, to manage land properly to preserve things that we value. Uh, now, conservation easements, as I, as I mentioned, is our, is our main tool. Uh, these are, this is different than parkland uh, because it stays in the title of the landowner. Uh, and lots of people have, they cherish the land and they want to see it preserved for future generations. Um, there is uh, a benefit property tax-wise because essentially you lose the development potential on the land and the tax man can't tax you as if it would be subdivided next year. Uh, the other thing is that if any portion of the land is donated, you can get an income tax deduction. Uh, but for the community, it helps preserve landscapes. Uh, it, it's flexible enough that a landowner, say, if, if they're going to put their farm in, could reserve some acreage to build a house for their kids just for instance, or reserve hunting rights. Um, and again, it stays on the tax roll. So we think it's a win-win. Uh, and the land trust has uh, worked with farm to preserve uh, several whole farms in the Kinney Valley. But here's a summary of what we've done. Um, you know, as we said, the Kinney is a unique place. Uh, it's got the highest uh, standard for trout uh, given by the DNR. Uh, it's both extraordinary and outstanding. Outstanding is above town, extraordinary below town. Uh, water quality is good enough. It's not been stocked since 1974. And we have a tremendous variety of uh, plants, uh, rare and endangered species uh, that live in the valley. Uh, so over that 25 years, uh, the land trust has uh, preserved, and it's, I should change this slide, it's over 10 miles of stream bank. We've protected over 3,000 acres, uh, of which we manage directly uh, over 1,900. And then we've worked in partnership with the DNR uh, and Wildlife Service to preserve another 1,000. And the preserves that we own are at strategic locations along the river to provide uh, access, but overall, um, it's, it's a great thing for the public. Uh, so we also do a lot of planning and um, the uh, upper part of the watershed uh, is shown in that looks like a red squiggly worm, uh, but that's where we are, right between Hammond and Roberts. Uh, the river itself starts as a spring pond a little over a mile north of 94. Uh, so it's, it's quite extraordinary, but the watershed extends about nine miles, almost up to Aaron Corners, south of Richmond. Uh, and it, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary place. So, uh, and it, it, things are working well today, but it, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, oh, the other thing, we, we have partnered with the DNR 
uh, where that big spring pond is, and we've got over a section of land assembled there uh, to make sure that at least the headwaters, the starting lifeblood of the river remains preserved. Um, and we hope maybe someday, uh, not in the not too distant future, to have an outdoor classroom uh, for students you know, in this area. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna expand this a little bit uh, to talk about two rivers that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, uh, growing up in Ellsworth, uh, it was the best day possible to be on the Rush River. And then uh, the interesting thing is when I was growing up, the Kniknik, especially the lower Kniknik, had no trout. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain how the trout came back in a minute. But uh, these are some extraordinary watersheds, uh, some of the best in the eastern United States. Uh, the uh, Rush is a little bigger, uh, a little more, both uh, start in St. Croix County and, and move on through uh, the Kinnickinick going to the St. Croix, lower St. Croix, and the Rush going down uh, into the Mississippi near Maiden Rock. Uh, and it's also, the, all the orange you see on there uh, is either prime farmland or farmland of state significance. So it's a huge percentage of the total watershed uh, is farmland. And that's why we're so interested in managing it uh, for current and future generations. Um, so the soil conservation ethic started actually with a soil survey done, if you can see, if you can read real well, 1933, actually before the Dust Bowl. Um, and this identified areas of erodible soil. And in the authorizing legislation for public law 7446, they recognized that the wastage of soil and moisture resources on farm, grazing, and forest lands is a menace to the national welfare. You know, let that sink in a little bit. But out of this came uh, a good part of the Ag Extension Service, Soil Conservation Service, uh, and uh, Soil Conservation Service uh, eventually morphed to be the NRCS, uh, which is a very active and important partner in uh, farmland and stream preservation today. Um, back to the Kinney just a little bit, uh, because it had a lot of prime farmland around it, and uh, a lot of water power, uh, thanks to the waterfalls. Uh, it was heavily used to power the growth of the community, sawmills, uh, slaughterhouses, flour mills, laundries. Uh, essentially, uh, the river was devoid of life. Uh, one author described it as a hellhole of devil's broth. Uh, and those dams were repeatedly washed out in part due to a high rate of erosion coming out of the watershed. Uh, and uh, the uh, kind of unrestrained growth and timber cutting. But it was recognized after a big flood that took the building, out, uh, the dam out by the last building I showed, uh, that it was time to do something about our streams and uh, there was a, in one of the books describing the formation of the Soil Conservation Service, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna read this to you too, I think it's pretty profound. A land is as good as its arteries, and with the general cooperation and support, stream improvement work may well be, may well prove to be the magic key to open the way to better land, water, wildlife, and a more productive agriculture. Uh, I think, he hit it dead on uh, in the 30s. Now, this wasn't just done by government agencies. Uh, sportsmen's groups are very active in preserving rivers. Uh, in River Falls, their rod and gun club went out with the DNR to contact landowners and uh, did habitat restoration work. Over 30 miles of fencing to keep cattle out of the river 
Uh, they gave them cattle crossings so they could get water. Uh, but it was a, it was a, a tremendous uh, thing that happened. Uh, and all the while, uh, the DNR kept stocking trout. Um, and back then, the key to catching fish was to know where the hatchery truck was, because it was a put and take fish. Wherever the, whatever bridge the hatchery uh, truck stopped at, that's where you fished. Um, in the early 1960s, again after a big flood event, um, the DNR acquired uh, 21 easements, and they're shown in yellow uh, on there, but uh, they're to provide public access uh, to the river. And then uh, in 1993, uh, when the Kinney Land Trust was formed, we've acquired another 34 easements along with three preserves. But in total, uh, working collaboratively, about 50% of the river frontage and uh, the major tributaries uh, is now protected. Um, but despite all that good work, in 1970, uh, there were no trout in the lower Kinney. Well, the city had to do its part too, the city of River Falls. Under DNR orders, um, the wastewater treatment facilities were upgraded twice. Uh, and equal, of equal importance, uh, the dams and, and the city had a, electric, a uh, municipal utility and they relied heavily on the rivers. Uh, because of their impact on trout, the um, city was forced to switch to run of the river, which maintained a steady flow. And so a combination of that and two decades of soil and con uh, water conservation work allowed the river temperatures to drop by 10 degrees. Uh, and soil erosion was cut by an estimated 75%. So in 1978, just a few years later, uh, there was an excellent uh, population of brown trout found in the river. Actually, it was good enough that they stopped stocking in 1974. So those investments paid off. Um, and it, um, you know, as I said earlier, this doesn't happen just with the efforts of a land trust. Uh, there's lots of public and private entities, government entities that are dedicated to preserving soil and water, so we're not alone. Um, so I'm going to switch over now to um, conservation practices because there was quite a battle. I mean, the river was beautiful to start with. Um, it went through some rough decades and was corrected. And, and to keep it uh, where it is, I think, is, is a real part of my mission personally and um, uh, that of the land trust and other groups. Because um, activities on the land do definitely affect uh, the quality of water. And there's factors that are directly related to land use practices and some that are not. But weather patterns, uh, land use trends, uh, the type of conservation practices that are used, and uh, climate change can definitely affect the river. Remember, we don't have that much margin uh, in terms of cold water. Um, but any climatologist you talk to will tell you that our climate has gotten wetter and more humid, which leads to heavier rainfall events. Uh, you actually have to manage your nutrients differently uh, when you have heavier rainfall events. You can lose a lot of good investment. Uh, and then your design has to be different too. I think a lot of the design in our CS uses are for 10-year events. You know, when you have 100 and 500 and 1,000 year events uh, with some regularity, uh, it may need, you know, a management uh, change. You need to look at your management change. Um, a definite ray of hope is uh, some of the leaders in installing this are farmer-led councils. And uh, we have one that's been in operation for a while uh, on the Lower Kinney, and uh, a new one forming up up in this area. Um, as far as land use trends, 
there is less farms and more concentration of animals. That's not strictly true, but it, it's definitely a trend. Um, there are issues in other parts of the state uh, where they have karst uh, topography, uh, where there is a significant amount of groundwater contamination. And there's pressure on groundwater use. There's also a trend away from continuous cover crops uh, like hay, pasture, and uh, CRP. I mean, we all know that that acreage has, been, has dropped by a third, and that's had an effect both on wildlife habitat and, and water quality. Um, there's, uh, people may not necessarily sell their land, uh, but when they keep it, they'll want some income from it, so they rent it. And uh, a renter can have a very different attitude towards the land than an owner that's been there for generations. Um, and then we've got a big influx because of our proximity to the Twin Cities of uh, people with no agricultural background coming out to the country, uh, you know, mowing five acres of lawn. Uh, I don't want to spend my whole Saturday doing that, but some people do. Um, some people may have, you know, other, other reasons for owning it, uh, such as uh, converting it to residential or commercial uses, which decreases habitat, adds to impervious surfaces, etc. So that all can affect water quality. Um, as I mentioned, uh, farmer-led councils, um, we've, got, we've got four, uh, along with the Western Wisconsin Conservation Council that is starting up. And I think as with soil and water conservation practices that were put in in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, the top farmers in areas tend to be the ones willing to try. And uh, uh, their neighbors might not want to be first, but they'll be a quick second if they see it works. And I think that's a great model. It's a model that's worked before. Uh, so s some of the things that help streams and runoff nutrient management in include uh, grade stabilization structures. Uh, that's quite a washout on the picture on the left, as opposed to the berm that was constructed. Um, you know, this picture was taken in the same year. Uh, but it doesn't stop runoff, but it slows it down. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's good uh, for the watershed. Um, seeing a lot, lot more uh, of protecting soils during all seasons uh, with uh, minimum till or no till um, or putting down cover crops uh, for the off season. I mean, there's some trick to getting this to work, but it, there's more and more people employing these strategies for uh, soil, water conservation, nutrient management, building organic matter in the soil. Uh, it's, it, it's effective. Uh, and, uh, you know, the boogeyman in the room is uh, phosphorus. Um, you know, everybody needs it to get their crop of corn or beans or whatever. But, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, it, it leaves the field, whether th directly through runoff or through erosion. But one pound of dissolved phosphorus can generate 300 to 500 pounds of algae uh, within the watershed. And that's why, this, despite being a national wild and scenic river, is uh, uh, an impaired waterway under the Clean Water Act. Um, some other things that not only conserve soil but provide habitat are uh, grass waterways and buffer strips. Um, you can see the, in the picture on the right there is row crop and then uh, continuous cover, uh, typically, you know, a grass pasture mix. But that buffer strip slows water, collects nutrients. Uh, slow, uh, it's it's good uh, in the appropriate place. Uh, so I don't have the data for uh, Saint Croix County, but I think you ought to be aware that there is a transect done of farming practices. And in Pierce County, um, you can see that 
Uh, in the Kinney, uh, they have the lowest rate of soil loss of the uh, trout streams in Pierce County, uh, below the county average. And uh, if you really like stats, uh, uh, you can see that uh, the upper rush in the Kinney have the best conservation practices uh, of the streams. That might be because some of those fishermen, or some of those farmers are trout fishermen. I, I tend to think there's a strong correlation, but it is important. Um, so another thing with managing uh, the water resource, a, a quick overview of the hydrogeology I think is important. Um, you can see that uh, those black lines are ancient fault lines which affect our geology, uh, but in our area, and you can see Pearson St. Croix County, uh, it's sedimentary rock, both limestone and sandstone uh, that are actually great sources of, of groundwater. Um, the ground, groundwater is available. We're, we're flipping it now to a cross section. Uh, but at the bottom, you can see, uh, you can see the harder uh, impervious rock that tends to direct uh, water flow. Uh, the upper rock, think of it as more or less a a big sponge where water is available at varying depths, uh, both the fuel streams, uh, water wells, uh, and other. But this this ranges on the left from the St. Croix River, which is the edge edge of the watershed, over to the Red Cedar, which is on the eastern side of uh, St. Croix County. But it's an extraordinary uh, deposit uh, brought to us by ancient tectonic forces and uh, and glaciers. Uh, a little more descriptive view of our geology, you can see the top gray layer is, is glacial till via mixtures of uh, clay, sand, and gravel. Uh, tends, <laughs> tends to yield pretty well. Uh, and uh, depending on how the lay of the land is, uh, your drainage channels uh, and, and will follow the contours. Uh, and then beneath all that, the dotted line will be your, your water table uh, where, uh, where our water comes from from uh, public agricultural and, and industrial uses. And you'll notice that it is a karst topography, which is basically limestone that's subject to, uh, subject to forming cavities and, and other things uh, that uh, can change groundwater flow uh, based on how those cavities have formed over time. Um, they also, uh, sometimes they can even form sinkholes. Um, the groundwater uh, doesn't, it roughly follows land contours, um, but it does go in three dimensions and things you do uh, to tap into the groundwater can affect the flow. Um, this is a little closer view uh, from a study that was done about uh, in 2004, 2005, uh, showing the Kinney uh, and the gradient uh, towards the river. But again, the, this probably doesn't mean much, but when the river comes into River Falls, it's flowing at about 35 cubic feet per second. When it hits the County F Bridge at the State Park, it's at 95 cubic feet per, per second. So there's tremendous groundwater uh, recharge coming in there. And you're gonna see uh, very similar things on the rush. Um, so I talked about watersheds quite a bit. Um, everything in purple drains to the St. Croix. Uh, and, the, uh, and the tan, yellow, and blue uh, go into the Mississippi. Um, but Watershed management uh, is, uh, you know, techniques uh, are pretty applicable. The big difference uh, is that there's a lot more regulation on phosphorus because of the impaired waterway status of the lower St. Croix. Um, groundwater is readily available here. This is from the county land and water conservation plan that uh, should be adopted in a month or so. 
there, you can see that in our area, uh, between highways uh, 63 and uh, uh, 46, uh, that water is, is plentiful and fairly shallow. Uh, the orange down in and around River Falls are those bluffs. Uh, so just, just to get your reference, but you know, there is, uh, we're blessed with not only fertile land, but uh, a lot of available water at relatively low depths. That really helps productivity. Um, and then because this is glacial till, uh, there's a tendency for a lot of sand and gravels. Uh, the green in the middle there is a Jewett formation. Uh, which is drought prone and where there tends to be uh, center pivot systems put in. Um, so again, right in the headwaters area, there's a lot of light soil. Um, I know that was a focus of the county's soil and water conservation plan. Um, so what happens when you put a well in? Um, you know, there's a groundwater uh, level that's established and the uh, well takes advantage of it by pulling water out. And as the pumping goes on, it tends to depress the water table level in the vicinity of, of the uh, wellhead. Um, if you have the well spacings tight and consistent pumping, you can draw down uh, the water table. Uh, and that um, is something that I know the county plan is gonna be looking at uh, there is water use uh, reports put together by uh, people that uh, have the high capacity wells, but uh, you know it's it's something that you know it, you know I showed you how important groundwater is to these streams. It's something we need to be vigilant about. Uh, and I don't know how well this shows up, but the top uh, cross section shows normal flow to the river. Uh, the second one shows what happens if a well, you know, high capacity well, for instance, was put close to the river. Uh, you can actually change the flow. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is uh, possible, in it, it, especially in small and isolated aquifers, uh, to really affect uh, the flow of small streams or ponds. Uh, the other thing we can't forget about is uh, St. Croix County is one of the fastest growing counties in the state. Um, this study again was back from 2003 or 2004, 2005, but you know, at that time the municipal water use was about six and a half million gallons per day. And if you project that five year growth or 5% growth rate out to 2020, uh, it's uh, more than doubled. Uh, I don't know if there's, this was the best source I could find, but I think it's likely uh, that this has occurred, especially with our growth, growth rates. So there is demand on our resources. Um, again, back to that study, uh, there was a water budget done. Um, and essentially within our counties, most of the groundwater we have is recharged directly within the county. Um, and uh, the rivers uh, that are flowing in bring in 15% and the rivers flowing out uh, discharge 85% of it, uh, whether it's to the St. Croix or, or Mississippi. Um, and at that time, the well use was quite low in terms of total water budget. Um, so, you know, that, that I think is what, what needs to be monitored. I mean, we need, Water, you know, we need water uh, for all sorts of things. Uh, it's just that can we achieve the balance to have both productive agriculture and uh, quality trout streams. Um, so, you know, to, to boil it all down, you know, can wells have much of an impact? Um, in some places in the state they have. Uh, the guesstimate based on simulation from this study was that, um, in the upper uh, upper la layers of the water table, it could draw it down by as much as 10%. Uh, in the confined aquifers, the deep ones, 
it could have a more significant effect because there isn't the amount of recharge happening down deep as there is uh, towards, towards the surface. Um, so I'm switching again on you to, to really talk about the importance of agriculture. Uh, it, um, 58 percent of our land in the county uh, is owned and managed by farmers. I mean, the landscapes we know, we love, we enjoy uh, are largely due uh, to farmers and, and rural landowners. Um, and so they're extremely important in terms of land use. Uh, and another thing you often hear is that, oh, the big corporates are taken over. Um, you know, in St. Croix County, University Extension uh, did an economic impact study, and part of that uh, looked at farm ownership. And at that time, uh, if you look at it, only 1.6% of the land was managed by corporate farms. So, it, you know, I, I think there's a bit of a misnomer out there, you know, whether it's a farm family, a partnership, a corporation, the vast majority of the land is still owned and managed locally. And I think that's an important thing, you know, in terms of policy. It's, it, you know, they are we or they are us. So, uh, you know, it's important. Um, you know, the numbers are, are significant. About 10% of our total ec economic activity, uh, a sizable number of jobs uh, and income. And, uh, you know, dairy farming, is kind of the, the brand that Wisconsin carries around the nation with our license plates and other things. Uh, but it's very significant in St. Croix County. Uh, not just off the farm dairy product sales, but processing, actually turning into butter, cheese, and other delectable things. Uh, there's significant value enhancement done uh, <coughs> right within our county. And, uh, you know, walking around thing, if you want, is uh, each cow you see out there is worth about $34,000 in production. Does that square with what you think, Dean? <laughs> Not a good year? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, so, um, it, it, you know, in addition to the um, soil and water conservation practices that I showed on those earlier slides, there's Significant advances uh, in precision agriculture, uh, whether it's on a combine, a, a tractor, uh, a spray rig, uh, the, um, what's needed can be applied based on soil type. And it, this doesn't come across very clearly, but in this, this is an irrigation unit uh, that's got uh, wireless n nodes that control the uh, application rates but where you can see the water, there's, there's nothing uh, going in, uh, as opposed to maybe on top where you've got some light soil, you'd have a heavier application of fertilizer and nutrients. Um, and I think we have to be open to new technology. Um, this spring with the late snow, I think everybody saw uh, manure out on the snow. Um, you know, it's, it's a risky thing, not just from a runoff standpoint, but uh, because the, the uh, farmer is counting on those nutrients to help him grow that spring's crop. And uh, if he loses it, it, you know, it's bad all the way around. And uh, so there's, there needs to be a better way. And you know, as more people move from the city to the country, uh, you used to be able to say, you know, when you're spreading, on uh, the spring that smells like money. I think there's fewer and fewer people that will agree with you, but at least when I grew up, spreading manure smelled like money. Uh, at least that's what my dad always told me. So, um, but I think the bigger you get, the more uh, intensive the operation, the more important it is to manage waste properly. Um, and what you're gonna be hearing about a little bit later is a different way of managing it. I, I think it's uh, got a lot of positives. Um, and, you know, I'll save that for Tim. But, you know, we, we, we know agriculture is important. We know handling a waste can be a big issue. 
with trout streams, uh, you'll be hearing about a different way. Um, you know, we have everything in yellow here is prime farmland. We can see those red uh, spots are areas of where development is coming. Uh, record rates in Hudson and River Falls in the last couple of years. Uh, things could change in a hurry. Um, it's important to protect our prime farmland while we can. Uh, typically that's a matter of cooperative landlords and uh, especially town boards that understand uh, the kind of environment farms need to operate. Uh, and I'll, I'm getting towards the end here, but you know, here's Roberts. It used to be a little farm town. Um, I'm gonna, Twin Lakes down in the lower left-hand corner, just below the Highway 94 sign, uh, but mostly farmland around. And uh, that headwaters uh, preserve is outlined in yellow uh, in the lower right-hand corner. That's uh, the dog I have in the, in the fight. Um, whereas now, this is uh, last June, uh, can you see how much bigger Twins Lake, Twin Lakes is in the lower left-hand corner? Uh, as opposed to the footprint of the city, of, uh, or the village of Roberts, um, you know, there, there is growth happening. Um, it, and uh, they're making a little cement and selling a little gas down on the inter interchange too. So, I mean, growth is coming. And uh, I guess it's a value proposition. What, what do we value? Uh, and, uh, you know, I, agriculture and, and trout fishing, I think, can go hand in hand uh, to help preserve our way of life. So uh, thanks for staying with me. Okay. I, think, uh, I will take one or two questions now, and then uh, we'll have the panel discussion after Tim's. Are there any questions for Dave at this point? Thank you, Dave. Um, if you can pass the question off. Okay. Uh, well, now I'd like to introduce Tim. Uh, Tim is a professor of business development, energy finance, and energy energy professional at uh, Texas University of Texas. His research and educational programs are renewable energy executives, professionals, and policy leaders. He has over 30 years of experience in industrial renewable energy projects and policies for both executive and advisory capacities. Tim holds a senior position with Recon Associates, an energy and product development consultancy. Uh, Recon's clients include renewable energy, agribusiness, and manufacturing companies. The Open Society Institute, USDOE, USDA, USAID, and the World Bank. Recon's practice experience includes biorefinery, wind, solar, and biomass projects in 45 different countries. The program has been a general overview of anaerobic digestion system uh, development and operation. We will discuss digestive project risk and management tactics to address um, and uh, the aim to increasing understanding of how these types of biorefinery systems work, including achievement of operational and financial objectives. With that, I hand it over to Tim Bay. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Art. 1984, was, I was working for a company called Fulton Van Dyke, now called Fulton. And one morning, I had two engineers jump into my office, all excited. They said, we need you, we need you, we need you. And I said, well, OK, great, cool. It's nice to be loved, but why? We want to sell an anaerobic digestion system to Packerland Packing. What? Awesome. What's an anaerobic digestion system and why me? Well, there were 300 people in the firm and I was one of two that knew how to work a spreadsheet. So I became the modeler and I drank the Kool-Aid. That was my first AD project. It paid for itself in 14 months. Really, the reason it paid for itself is they were able to shut down the pretreatment plant at this big slaughterhouse in Green Bay. I'm not here today to advocate nor pro nor con on AD systems. I just have a lot of experience with anaerobic digestion. So the presentation, and I'm 
going to do the classic presenter, never do this, never apologize right out the shoot. I'm going to give you information overload. But I want to expose you as a bunch of stakeholders in an area where a project's being proposed to have a really good frame of reference. And so this, this presentation will be provided, Eric already has it, and you can refer to it. I'm going to give you overload though. And then we're going to focus on a couple of different themes. And, and I guarantee you, I will probably trip today. Okay, simple agenda. We're going to talk about fundamentals. I'm going to give you a bunch of different slides. What's the status of this anaerobic digestion industry? What are some trends? What are the key components to a system and a system success? What are options in terms of designs of system? And how do you evaluate performance? Basics is you put organics in to a reactor. You control the environment. You add feeder. And out of that system, it's a gut. It produces methane, carbon dioxide, water, primarily. There are some other things it concentrates as well. Nutrients in particular come in in an organic state and they come out in an inorganic state. So a digester doesn't create nor destroy nutrients, it flows through the system. As you can see there, the typical livestock waste crops, wastewater, food waste, increasingly municipal solid waste is becoming a feedstock for digesters. In most agricultural settings and farms, it's manure. Some cases, they bring in what's called an off-site substrate. It means you're bringing in material from outside of the farm to increase gas production. The digester acts like a gut. pH has to be maintained within a certain range. There are two types of primary types of bacteria. One's called mesophilic, the other one's called thermophilic. Mesophilic operates at about our body temperature. Thermophilic at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Out of this comes biogas. Most systems will produce about 60% of the, what's being produced and converted the organics is in methane. The other is carbon dioxide and water. There's also tends to be a fair amount of sulfur that comes out. This is you, this biogas, it can be used dirty in a boiler system that's really robust, it can handle this stuff, or it can be cleaned up. The best markets, as we'll talk about later, is to really clean it up and sell it to California. What else comes out of the digester are the solids. The nutrients flow through, the non-destroyed organics flow through the process, if it's a mesophilic or a lower temperature, higher amounts of solids come out of it. If it's a thermophilic or a higher temperature one, you get kind of like an ash, looks like an ash that comes out of it. But you get more gas production. That's a general, real general overview. There's, this has been studied to death. Why? Well, compared to Europe, we have a lot of organics that don't get reused, don't get recovered. In some areas in Europe, and I, I won't belabor this too much, um, in particular Germany, um, there's a digester on every corner. The primary reason for that is Russia. Okay. In the post Yeltsin days, when Putin was first became the Prime Minister of Russia, um, Gazprom, which is the big oil company in Russia, had a few disputes with some buyers in Europe, and they turned off the spigot. And when you turn off a spigot in the middle of winter, and you're depending on natural gas from Russia, you get cold. 
And the leadership in Germany decided that strategically they would never let that happen again. And so it's these renewable identification numbers. Every gallon of ethanol produced in the United States has a RIN assigned to it. Every amount of biogas produced in the United States that's sold in this program has a number assigned to it. In some cases, the dairy operations and the crop operations that were traditionally producing foodstuffs don't even produce foodstuffs anymore. They produce stuff to put into their digester instead. So the table was quite flipped. We've done a lot of research in this space, and I can provide access to anybody in this audience or anybody you're affiliated with with these documents. But it's been a thoroughly evaluated both as a platform for waste conversion, for residual conversion, and for energy production. What are fundamental assumptions when looking at a digester project? First is, historically, they have produced predictable but humble economic returns. The primary drivers the motivations for the economic motivations for digesters in the state of Wisconsin up until recently were two things. Primarily, betting. They produced betting for dairy operations. And the betting was predictable, it was consistent, it had very low pathogens if produced correctly. And the other was electricity. And for a period of time, the state of Wisconsin offered I wouldn't call them attractive, but they would break even point, maybe a little bit beyond break even point, buyback rates for power being generated on farms. But if you think about it, two things. One, manure is a pretty bad substrate for producing gas. Why? Because it's already been digested by a pretty efficient machine called a dairy cow. There's not a lot of organics left in that material. Second is there's a lot of water involved in dairy manure. Lots of it. So historically, this, this thing called a dianaerobic digester, just based on dairy manure, hasn't produced a lot of really good returns. That said, if designed well and operated by an experienced operator, there's pretty low technology risk here. They, these things do perform pretty well. You have, to, you have to manage them. You can't turn them on, walk away, and hope that it's still operating at the end of the day. And they have to be designed well. You can't shock the system, just like the child stream. You have to operate it. This is a biological system. It has to be operated within parameters. USAID projects tend to have single or few substrates. As you see, I'll let you read it as well as I can. The transport fuel, transportation fuel option is the game changer. And this happened out of, out of California. It's called a low carbon fuel standard. Well, there are two big programs in the, in the United States. One's called the Renewable Fuel Standard. That's a federal program. The reason that there's 10% ethanol in all of our gasoline is a result of the Renewable Fuel Standard. It was drafted and promoted by the uh, Bush administration, Bush II, and has been the law of the land since then. Well, in 2012, and then again in 2014, Biogas was named as a renewable fuel, qualified for the incentives of the renewable fuel standard, as long as it's used for transportation purposes. Along came California. They looked at this and they said, you know what, we can do it one better. And they produced a program called the low carbon fuel standard. What does that imply? In both cases, Biogas, whether it comes from anaerobic digestion or landfill, if it can be cleaned up and put on the pipeline and sold to a trucking company in California, it qualifies for both of these subsidies, benefits. We're talking night and day difference between selling biogas 
for what we call brown fuel or the fuel value, which is about $3 a decatherm. In cases where you can effectively sell gas to California, you can make somewhere between $40 to $80 a decatherm. There's a little bit of a difference between the two. And that's why investors and developers like this option of taking organic substrates, organic feedstock, putting it in the digester, and moving on. There is the holy grail, and then I'll move on to di uh, digester designs and trends. The holy grail, though, is this. In order for you to take advantage of these programs, of these incentives, you have to be able to take your digester gas and insert it into a pipeline. You have to get a pipeline to cooperate. You have to clean it up to the pipeline standards. It has to be the pressure of the pipeline. The interconnection or the equipment to inject it into the pipeline has to be approved by the pipeline. And then you have to find a buyer who's going to use it to move their trucks. The other pathway that was approved four years ago was that if that digester gas is generated through a gen center, an, a, an engine, Caterpillar engine or a Yembacher, a GE engine, and then sold to a utility, and the utility uses it for electrical vehicle charging stations, it qualifies for the same incentives. It's called an E-RIN program. E for le electricity, RIN for renewable identification number. That's a lot more convenient way, especially for farm-based systems that don't have a pipeline running through their property. Because they, tenor farms still have wires running through their property, or have the ability to put it onto the grid. That is our holy grail. Nothing's been approved, a lot of pressure to do so, um, and a lot of investment capital hoping that this comes true. Okay, biogas is a cellulosic fuel. If you can clean up that gas, if you can put it on the pipeline, and if that gas is primarily from manure, or municipal solid waste landfills, it qualifies for what's called a D3, which is the highest value. On a per gallon basis, a D3 will get you about $2.20 today, okay? So you can sell the gas for what it's worth and the fuel value, and then you get on top of that, you get $2.20 on the gallon equivalent. And if you sell it to California on a per ton basis, you get $100, $120 additional on top of that. It makes it quite attractive. Okay, trends. Looks like we got a lot of them. 80% 80 per, 80 of those are digesters and wastewater treatment systems. They take sludge that's left over from publicly owned wastewater treatment systems or industrial wastewater treatment systems. They digest it to reduce the amount of solids that they have to land, spread, or landfill. And in most cases, that gas is used in a boiler or is used to dry the remaining solids. It's not used to produce electricity or transportation fuel. It's used on site because it's convenient. Same holds true here. We have about 35 di farm-based digesters. All the rest of them are other operations, whether industrial or municipal. This document, uh, I provide reference to it, and I'll make access available through Eric, um, is a big study that was done about digesters in Wisconsin a couple of years ago. As you can see, there's 81 municipal wastewater digesters. 21 industrials, only 34 eggs. And that, that tends to go up and down a little bit. Most of those egg facilities, the farm-based ones, they're flaring their gas now because they can't make any money selling it, selling the electricity generating. It costs them too much to do so. So they're just flaring it. One last little bit is look at the heat only. 
Only seven of the operating facilities of municipal wastewater treatment are actually producing electricity. The rest of them are replacing natural gas. And here, the primary, the primary rationale for even having a digester has nothing to do with the energy. It has everything to do with reducing the amount of solids that remain that they have to landfill. It's very low tech. It, there's not a lot of thought that goes into our systems. Once you start adding a little creativity to these systems, though, you can start making them pay. So not only do you, is, is the option available for making money selling innovative renewable natural gas, but you also have the, off, the opportunity to sell into the carbon offset market. What? Carbon offset market? Those exist? Yeah, they do. They just don't exist at a national level. They exist in the Northeast, and they exist on the West Coast. And if you have good advisors and you're willing to pay for those, we call them transactional costs, you can actually sell carbon offsets into those markets. So much so that our neighbors to the Southwest um, have commissioned a very aggressive program to look at addressing hog, primarily hog manure facilities. And hog manure is even worse than, than dairy manure because it has a lot less solids and a lot higher sulfur on a per PPM basis, parts per million basis. But um, Iowa is promoting it. State of Washington has just developed a very comprehensive roadmap. All right, so. If I am looking at being a sponsor, if I'm looking at being a developer, if I'm a community stakeholder, if I'm an operator of wastewater treatment system, or I sit on the board of a municipal solid waste district, and I want to say, I want to look into this, what things should I be considering? Well, first is look at pu public-private partnerships. And if not public-private partnerships, collaborations among various stakeholders who would benefit from it. Design the project appropriately. You design it around the opportunity, not around the technology. I'll say that again. Design the project around the opportunity, not the technology. You don't bring the engineers in until you've identified the opportunity. You don't bring the engineers in until you've identified the problem you want solved. In the case of an ag system, you're looking primarily at underutilization or ineffective utilization of nutrients. Making gas on the side. Or you're looking at primarily producing gas and also providing a nutrient management. Creative secure assets. Assets mean buy-in from stakeholders as much as it does the boilers, the gensets, the collection systems. But most importantly, most importantly, more importantly than the design of the system is the security of the offtake and feedstock agreements. What are those? Feedstock agreements make certain because a, a system doesn't operate unless it has raw material to come in. And those raw material providers have to be willing to cooperate and meet contractual ob obligations. These are long-term contractual obligations. They have to be credit worthy and willing to collaborate and guarantee a certain amount of stuff coming in because otherwise the digester doesn't work. It's called the feedstock agreement. The second really important part is called the offtake agreement. That is the customer. Does the customer stand up? Does the customer sign on the dot and say, I will sign on and commit to buying your gas, or whatever you're producing from your gas, for 10 years, or 15, or 20 years? Those are the two critical elements to these projects. It's not so much the design. It's Will the stuff show up? Will you have enough that it will operate as planned? And can you sell it to your markets as you need to be able to sell it at a price you can afford? Okay, so you can read this 
feedstock, no, uh, project feasibility, we benchmark, we analyze, we evaluate the risks, and I'll go into detail. Benchmarking. What's the project's return on capital employed? Or return on investment? Capital employed is a better number, okay? Because every project has upfront numbers, has up de what are called development costs. Sometimes if a project takes multiple years, those development costs can come up to being 15, 20% of the overall project. That's a lot of money. What's the overall return on all the money going into the system? What are design and operational risks? And how are those risks managed and addressed? Are there capital investment constraints? Are there collaboration constraints? Especially collaboration with the government. We call this political risk. Okay, remember that renewable fuel standard program I talked about? Well, there's a sunset, 2022. Now, will that, re be, will that be renewed or not? Well, that's a good question. The renewable fuel standard tends to be um, most valued in those um, states we typically call red states. And so it's a popular program in the red states. Uh, low carbon fuel standard is a California program that was just adopted in Oregon. And Oregon is expanding on what California did. Well, Washington State and New York State, NYSERDA, are also adopting this. So the market is growing, but there are risks involved. Those are those collaborations and timetable as well as other things. Other things may be land spreading, land spreading restrictions, zoning and pressures in the neighborhood. Whoops. Okay. I'll get into these details. Let's look at the benefits. What are? Well, one is you produce electricity or you produce fuel for boilers. That's for your internal use. Then you sell. If you produce more than what you can use, you sell. Fertilizer. This is the um, Nirvana. Uh, I'll get off track here for just a second. I'm the pr primary author of a proposed piece of federal legislation that is um, intended to create an investment tax credit for phosphorus recovery. That means that if you're an investor, you're a developer, and you want to put a phosphorus recovery system and a wastewater treatment system, um, I don't care what the technology is. If you can demonstrate it recovers phosphorus, you're eligible for the investment tax credit. If you're a farmer that wants to replant your waterways with a crop that disproportionately picks up phosphorus and can be cropped a couple times a year, and either green fertilized or converted into a pellet for fertilizer use, your investment qualifies for the investment tax credit. I don't care what the technology happens to be. It's the holy grail. Uh, one last little comment. Uh, August last year, the National Organics Program, uh, which is the voluntary compliance, but USDA adheres to it, uh, for certified practices in the organic farming industry. Two of their technical review committees said that anaerobic digestion, nutrients, stuff coming out of the back end of a digester, qualified as organic fertilizer. And those two recommendations, that was after many years of lobbying and petitioning, those two recommendations have now sat and they haven't moved at the National Organics Program. Um, but if that were to happen and there was universal adaptation of digester nutrients, that's a game changer for the organics industry because their two biggest costs to growing organic crops are the nutrients and diesel fuel. Okay, so now design options. I'm going to go through a whole series of different iterations here. As I said, I'll make this available so you understand, but every digester begins at one point. And these slides are um, uh, very, very graciously provided to me by a company called Renew Energy. Uh, Renew is the, one of the oldest 
uh, digester design companies in Denmark. The basic concept, you take feedstocks in, there's no order, little or no tipping fees coming in, goes through a digester, you run it through what's called a combined heat and power, that's a generator. And then the, the, the gas goes to the generator and you do whatever you can to the nutrients and the, the um, um, solids coming out of that. That's a very simple system. Basic industries, livestock manure, liquid organic, dairy waste, wastewater treatment sludge. Next iteration is you upgrade the gas by scrubbing it. Scrubbing it, you remove the contaminants from that gas and you pump it into a pipeline. The reason for doing this is the low carbon fuel standard or, or selling the gas to transportation industries. Next step is you pre-treat it. You can, and th these don't always happen to happen, have to happen in sequence, but in order to make that stomach, that artificial stomach called a digester operate effectively, you need not to shock it. So in the front end of the system, they'll put a big, what's called a mixing tank in the system. So that some days you may get waste grain and you got manure, some days you may get fat soils and greases. You want to blend them all together so that the bugs, the bacteria operating in the reactor, see the same food day in and day out. Mechanical separation. Now we're taking the material and we're taking the biogas and we're upgrading a portion of that to pipeline grade or we're putting it back into a CHP, a combined heat and power plant. And we're mechanically separating the solids from the nutrients. This is typically done through either presses or centrifuges. We can take that one more step further and we can treat the process water with membranes. Reverse osmosis, ultrafiltration are the two most common techniques. What can you achieve to that? Pretty close to potable water. Now, there will be those developers and promoters that will take a membrane water and they'll do this and they'll I'm not recommending that, um, but it does happen. Um, I was at a grand opening one time that happened and I went, oh no. Now we get really sophisticated. We start taking a look at the nutrients and in this case, looking at the nitrogen. And we start looking at ways of stripping the ammonia from the, the ammonia from the digestate. This is an aqueous form, which means it can be used back in systems like ethanol plants, breweries, those type of things that need nitrogen for their processes, or it produces a refined type of nitrogen-based fertilizer or soil complement. Those are some basic designs. We build upon each in iterations based upon the market that's available for the end product. But that's not alone. That's just the design. Then we have the deployment or the application. Okay, now we're getting kind of fancy here. This is an urban model. It's based on a municipal solid waste project in Trenton, New Jersey. What goes into this system is sorted municipal solid waste and food processing wastes. The pretreatment eliminates the impurities, it goes to the digester. The digester, biogas, goes to biogas upgrading and is sold in the pipeline. There'll be a certain portion, because this is pretty big, that will also go into a small scale combined heat and power plant that operates this system, so it's self-contained. There'll be, a high there'll be a compost with high degrees of phosphorus, a 
concentrate with high concentrations of potassium and ammonium sulfate. The processed water is used for irrigation and wa washing water. Oh, my goodness. What's the siting criteria? Well, one, you have to have, to have a municipal solid waste district that cooperates. There's a negative price for the substrates, or you could actually get paid to take this stuff, just like a landfill does. You have to have proximity to the pipeline. If the, you don't have close proximity to the pipeline, the costs of building out your pipeline get factored into the capital budget, and in many cases, rule these things out. Power market with jurisdiction to reward you for renewable energy. Number five is still a pipe dream, the e rents And number six, a large scale wholesaler or reseller of the nutrients. What are key issues here? Well, the tipping fee. If I'm running a waste, a waste digester, I gotta make money taking the waste but I run into direct conflict with the landfill because the solid waste district also depended upon those tipping fees. Now I got an enemy, not an, advocate, not an advocate. Gas, okay, the gas has to be bundled with these rinds. Okay, an industrial model. This is basically the same system, but you have an industrial sponsor you're going to see more of an application to the heat and power. Again, you're going to have negative priced proximity to a gas line or a company that can use it on its own. All right, and then a rural program, an organic agricultural strategy. Now we've got numbers of different feedstocks coming in. We've got food processing wastes, organic from farms, and energy crops. Energy crops, you say? Yeah, energy crops. Energy crops. Sorghum qualifies, by the way. Sorghum qualifies under the last farm bill as an energy crop. You pre-treat it, blend it, digest it, gas on the pipeline, storage, degas, biogas, and nutrient sale. In this case, this comes from the slide that was targeted to Organic Valley. What do you need? Well, in order to max out the benefit from the nutrients, you have to have a high concentration of organic crop producers and or forward contract with those organic producers. Somebody who's going to value the, take the value of those nutrients. If you don't have those nutrients in this organic strategy, you're selling them as substitutes for conventional fertilizer. Doesn't mean that's a bad thing. You just gotta recognize there's a different value proposition between the two. Well, one market will value it as its organic source, another market, market will say, no, that's just some other fertilizer. Now I gotta figure out a way to use it. Is the substrate available and it cost? Now remember, let me go back one slide here. This is where this world gets a little complicated. Okay. In order to max out the value of these programs, the RINs, the federal program, the D3, calling it cellulosic biofuel, in order to max out or have the lowest carbon footprint fuel, in the low carbon fuel standard in California, you can't have this. This is questionable. All they want is waste from farms. Which means, we go through this, it reduces the economic performance, the gas performance of the gas production element of this but it optimizes your total revenue because you can sell it to California and you get a lot higher price. So there are lots of different trade-offs that go into the design of these systems.
Okay, now feasibility. I'm about, I'm about ready to wrap up and we'll go into Q&A. Does it meet, does the project meet a rate of return? And that's a rate of return, it's called an unlevered rate of return, means without debt. And does it pass the smell test in terms of all the contracts there, et cetera, et cetera, for the investor groups? Is cash flow sufficient to cover debt? Is there an exit strategy or is the investor going to hold on to this thing forever and manage it for cash flow? Are, is the credit worthiness of the off taker and the suppliers obvious? Is this the off taker somebody that nobody's ever recognized before or is it Chevron or BP? Chevron and BP are real active in this, in this world. Real active in this world. Are the farms new? New ownership, new operators? Or the producers of the substrate well established, been around for a long time? Can they stand by their contracts? Techno technological performance. Well, when I was interviewing digester firms many years ago for a big project I was heading up, we had interviewed many and we were in Denmark and Cat, Cat, Caterpillar and Cat Finance were two of our strategic partners and we interviewed a whole bunch. We knew that up until that point, this was 2004, 2005, that there had been some problems with U.S. systems in terms of their operating effectiveness and efficiency, they had downtimes. And this last company we interviewed, we said, well, on average, you know, what, what, what kind of downtime do you have with your operations? And this gentleman's company had about 25, 30 deployed, systems deployed. And he looked at me very sheepishly and he kind of turned red and he said, 15 days. And I said, you mean on average, those 25 systems are down about 15 days a year? And he goes, no, 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 no. One time we were down for 15 days. I went, okay. And I winked at my colleagues from Caterpillar. I said, we found our company. Not only did they have a track record of being able to produce that way, but they also had financial backing. That's the key here, is technology can be very sexy and appealing. One ruler as a developer you should never do is fall in, love, fall in love with the technology. You fall in love with the company behind the technology. If the company has a strong balance sheet, has been in business for a long time and is what's considered credit worthy, they're gonna stand by their guarantees. They may not have the most innovative practice, but they may have the one that you can rely on over the length of the contract. Quality of the management team. There are lots of different considerations for an investment, for blessing or opposing a project. 80% of it relies on this topic. Is the management team of quality, do they have experience, do they know what they're going to do? I'd much rather have a good idea an ex and an excellent management team than an excellent idea and an average management team. Permitting. Is a permitting process recognizable? And can you get an accurate estimate of the cost of compliance? Is there a probability of community resistance? And what's the cost of addressing the community resistance? Both of those in Wisconsin um, are challenging topics. General rule of thumb, as a developer, and that's, why, that's my expertise, is in project development. For every dollar a motivated community group has to spend against you, you're going to have to spend 10 to $25 in addressing those concerns. In the state of Wisconsin, if you can work with the DNR as a unit across all agencies that need sign off, as well as your local zoning and land conservation district, 
If you can operate within defined parameters, you can have a defined budget and you're going to add 25% to that budget to get you through that permit process. If you can't get the answers, that budget tends to grow and grow significantly. Fungibility, fundability. Does the developer have the resources to do the project or not? Do they have to go to outside sources of capital? Do they have to syndicate that capital? Does that mean that their equity partners or the bankers have to go out and raise money in addition to what they're willing to put in? Or is this a simple deal? Does the developer have the resources to see it through and add 25% for contingencies to that. And here's one of those busy things. You'll be included in your package as you request it. This comes from um, the um, Office of Energy Innovation from the state of Wisconsin, but it's about project challenges uh, for digester development. The number one is the weak, weak market for biogas energy. Um, that we have a complex regulatory environment in the state of Wisconsin that Wisconsin doesn't typically have a lot of um, available project capital that we have to go to the coasts to get that. Increasingly, uh, we can source it in Chicago and Minneapolis. Um, there are market barriers for biogas systems for these non-electricity projects. Um, in particular, um, EPA won't grant you those RINs until you've demonstrated you're operating. So you have to develop this project, have the risk, you may not qualify for the low carbon fuel standard or the EPA RIN program. You hope you're going to, you've done everything in the checkbox that says you, you can, but they won't grant you those programs until you've already operated. So the developers have to take the risk of doing such, which is substantial. Because otherwise, if, they, if those markets don't materialize, they're forced to generate electricity. And right now, I don't know specifically in this market, but on average, it's less than three cents a kilowatt hour in the wholesale market. And then based upon the assessment of that, you're faced with a no, go. A, no, a go, no go, or a wait decision, and that's my contact information. As I said, today was supposed to be a generic overview of digester systems and what makes them tick. What are the drivers involved, and what are the things that a developer has to go about? I wasn't here to advocate, but I will answer questions. I did my homework, okay? Um, I know the developer for the proposed project here. Um, the, that developer and I have had a good relationship, I'm not, but I'm not here to endorse their project, nor am I here to criticize their project. I will answer questions about siting and other related topics, though. Yes, sir. Good question. Question was, with a farm-based digester, what are the odor issues and the noise issues? Okay. Um, let me address the noise issue first. It depends primarily upon how the gas is being used. If the gas is being used in an engine, engines are loud. Okay. If an engine is not encased in a noise-reducing environment, a building, it can be really quite loud. If it's encased, you can barely hear it. That's manageable. Okay. Odor. Odor is a direct result of manure coming into contact with the atmosphere. Actually, it's the sulfur that makes it stink. That's when, when you pump, when you drive by a lagoon, it can be a pretty big lagoon. That lagoon's been settled. It doesn't really reek all that bad. But you take that, the solids, primarily the hydrogen sulfide that's in the bottom, and you land spread that and you expose it, the oxidation that occurs in that 
is what causes that rotten egg smell. No, there's almost no, there's almost no smell to the digesting process, okay? And the digestate, the solids that come out, those are composted. Now, there is a little bit of a risk to a composting. If you have a small scale, there are two, th two, two primary risks to compost. One's leachate. That is, you know, rainwater coming down, leaching it through. If you don't have a leachate collection system and you got a trout stream, you got an issue. The second part of this is with large scale, and this happens to do with all composting systems throughout the nation. They're under increasing scrutiny because of the air emissions from the compost. Nit NOx in particular, Not nitrous oxides are produced. That's why compost typically, it's been turned a bunch of times, has very little nitrogen left in it because it's all been oxidized and released into the atmosphere. And large-scale composting systems are now under increasing scrutiny under Clean Air Act regulations because they're, if they're large enough, they're being concerned that they're a primary source of air emissions. So even compost is being critiqued. Good question, so. Um, but, but by the way, um, Farm-based ones do tend because there's more manure being spilled before it goes between point A and point B. Um, larger scale systems that have transfer station, the transfer station typically is this place that smells the worst. Okay, it's not the digesters themselves. It's where the trucks are coming in and pumping it into the pretreatment tank and that, but you can contain that in, the, in a building. Yes, sir. Front, front. So, um, so what's the, what's the Good question. Good question. Okay. Um, let's talk about storage systems coming in, and then I'll talk about how those things react. Just like pretty much all modern day manufacturing, this is a manufacturing facility, it's just in time. Okay, so you design the system to have it be recharged with new feedstock every day. You can design for contingency purposes, holding tanks, pretreatment tanks, and those benefit for two, two things. One. If you have a major storm event, you don't have your stuff coming in, you got stuff that's readily available on site. Second is you pretreat them. You blend them or mix the substrates together so that the bugs inside the digester say the same type of food day in and day out. Most modern systems do not have single reactors. Many do. Um, there's a, and there's a common digester technology developed by a very good friend of mine, um, Steve Dwarak. Well, he didn't develop it, but he, it's his platform. It's called a modified plug flow, where you put the, you put the, the manure in the front end, and it makes its way through the system in about 28 days. There are above ground systems that will be partial mix or complete mix systems, and those tend to be in sequence, okay? Where there'll be partial digestion in one, and then it'll go to the next in a different operating environment, and it complete, completes the digestion system. There are often systems where they'll run those two parallel, and they may run, I'm getting kind of in the weeds here, but Stay with me. They'll run at the low temperature system in the front end, the mesophilic in the front end, and then finish it off with a thermophilic system to optimize the conversion. Running parallel systems, the benefit is you can shut down one line, clean it out. Because no matter how careful you are, you bring in stuff. You can bring in stuff like this to gravel and lots in between, okay? But they all need to be cleaned. 
in order, on a routine basis, on a scheduled basis. Okay. Did I answer your questions? Okay, sir. Biggest issue is contamination, both pathogen and what other people put in their toilets. Okay, if you'd have to work directly, I'd be skeptical. But you'd have to work directly with the digester operator about the eligibility of that feedstock. Okay, there may be motivation to do a, you know, a treatment system for you for your pump septic systems. The biology is the same. The problem is we can rely on cattle on what they put into their gut and what comes out of their gut. People are not quite as reliable. Conceivably, yes. Yes, because it's the same biology. Uh, theoretically, absolutely. Okay. Is this proposal, would that person be interested in something like that? Well, what, what typically happens with yours was you, you bring your pump. My holding tank's got to get pumped this year. Okay. Um, that's going to go to a wastewater treatment system. And you're going to pay a tipping fee. You pay a tipping fee to dispose it in the wastewater treatment system. The sludge that remains from those systems then gets digested to produce gas. If you're suggesting to circumvent the dissolved airflow system of those wastewater treatment systems, you'd have to work directly with the digester operator. I'm not saying it's not possible, okay? Um, but they have to be a win-win for both of you. You're still going to produce gas. That gas is will qualify for some incentives. Um, um, it's a, that you ask a really good question. Okay, I can't give you a definitive answer to because of the contamination, both in terms of what people put down their toilets and the illnesses, the pathogens that humans have as compared to animals. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Question in the back. The, the man. Humans also take an awful lot of drugs. Are the drugs in that uh, human waste? Is that also a problem? As it is in as it is in the all the antibacterial treatments that ruminants get. Yes. Yes, it has to be addressed in the digestion operation as well. Well, first off is, and uh, that's a legitimate concern, okay? There are ways of managing order. They all cost money. Now, 
for an on-farm system where the skidder is taking the bedding and the manure and picking it up, putting it into a conveyor and or of dropping it into a pit and it goes into the digester. That, that order control happens between the barn and the digester unit. Where there are, uh, in case there, there, there's a digester system that operates in Wanakee, um, just north of Madison. And that's their, the manure is piped from three different farms, from the barn, One's got a sand system, so there's a sand recycling capture, cleanup. The other two are not sand-based bedding systems, and they are piped directly to the digester. The digester, there is an aroma in the, in the solids building. There's very little aroma or odor in the other digesters. Then there's the transfer station system. And that's where it's collected by truck, brought to the digester complex, and then the, is, is uh, transferred into the pretreatment. The odor that comes from that type of system is in that transfer station. Because once the substrate, once the stuff enters in, it's in a sealed system all the way through. So it goes into the pretreatment, it's pumped in from the pretreatment system to the reactor or to the series of reactors, and then utilized. What comes out of that system is the digestate, which doesn't have much in organics left, and that tends to go into a lagoon. The solids that remain are pressed and composted. There can be a certain degree of odor that comes out of a compost, but it smells like a compost like your compost in the backyard. Where the smell is an issue is the spills or spillage that occurs in the, trans the transfer station where the manure is pumped from the truck to the pretreatment. That transfer station can be enclosed. You can have reverse air flow into that system that pulls air into the system continuously, not letting it escape ambient, to the ambient, to the atmosphere. Okay, fugitive odors. Is there a, are there probabilities that you will experience bad odors? Those are identifiable and you can address those through management, but they cost money. Can I guarantee you that you're not going to have a system that doesn't smell? No, there will be smells. Will you have that strong hydrogen sulfide, rotten egg smell like liquid manure spread, knifed in during the spring or land spread after alfalfa has been harvested? You won't have those kinds of smells, typically on an efficiently run operation. You will have those smells with, with manure spread from a lagoon. From an environmental compliance, and this is an opinion, okay? From an environmental compliance perspective, in terms of nutrient management, regulatory compliance, um, a centralized digester system provides you one obligated party for multiple farms one identifiable obligated party for multiple farms as compared to land spreading systems where you have those multiple farms, now you have multiple obligated parties. The cost of compliance is much higher when you have multiple parties that you have to regulate, you have to inspect, you have to have them file, and so on and so forth, as compared to one system where you have one obligated party and you can require them to have insurance, significant amounts of it. So that is an editorial, okay? So that's, that's me passing a little judgment on the contrast between the two. Any other questions? All right, I thank you for your time. I won't make any coarse comments about what kind of industry that I'm involved in, but um, 
it's been fascinating, and um, I will stick around if any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask me privately. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Dave. Thank you all.